everyone. Uh, and welcome to Mozart Was a Red, written by Rothbard. Um, I think it's important before we start this play, um, as somebody that does technically identify as an objectivist, um, technically, um, I, uh, I think it's important to premise this with, um, she is, she's a hero of mine, and I hope that she's a hero of many people in this room. Uh, this play is not meant to be mean-spirited. Um, she, she had her moments, she was really funny. Um, she, she had little takes that were funny, and we're gonna, we're gonna make fun of a little bit of those, but it, it's important to give a little background information on this play. Um, one of the things that you'll notice will be brought up is uh, a, a letter about her novel that she received. Um, from Keith, who is Rothbard. Um, and that letter was actually six pages of gushing love for Atlas Shrugged. I mean, Rothbard adored Atlas Shrugged. And um, so what happened was uh, he was in and out of the circle, and the second time that he left, um, he started to write his own philosophy and was actually sued by Nathaniel Brandon for property rights on her material. He said that uh, Rothbard sold some of his intellectual property. So Rothbard, this was kind of his way of dealing with the situation, and it needs to be said that this is taken from a perspective of, of, of somebody that was irritated with Rand and her circle at the time. So there's, it's not objective, and but it is funny. So um, I hope you guys really enjoyed the play. Um, this is about killing the Buddha, and I don't know if you guys know the saying, killing the Buddha, but um, the idea is if you ever see the Buddha on the road, you should kill the Buddha, because you should always be um, trying to move forward in your ideas and not just look up to one figure as the overall authority on knowledge. And so today, we're gonna kill the Buddha and have a little fun doing it, so. Um, if, there he is, the man of the hour, Jeffrey Tucker. I gave you a grand entrance, darling. I know you were just wanted to make an entrance. Um, and can we have our Greta? So, um, the uh, characters, I should outline the characters. Carson Sand is Ayn Rand. Uh, Greta Lansing is uh, Barbara Brandon. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker was in the very original play, um, played Nathaniel Brandon, so he has been generous and is going to reprise his role as Nathaniel Brandon, uh, also known as Jonathan. And Keith is Rothbard. Um, and then, of course, George is my husband, Frank O'Connor. So, uh, that's the outline of the names. So, uh, with that, I think we are all ready to get started. Here we go with Mozart Was Red. Miss Sand, I I'd like to tell you how pleased I am that you wanted to see me. Oh, Keith, how could I not want to see you after you, you wrote me such a splendid letter about my novel? Oh, it, it was really nothing. Oh? Uh, I I I'd like to say, though, Miss Sand, that your, your book was an inspiration. The, the Brow of Zeus was one of the finest novels I've read in years. <sighs> Mr. Hackley, did you say one of the finest novels? Wait, yes! Well, wait, uh, do you care to offer us the name of any novel you've read in years that even remotely compares to The Brow of Zeus? <laughs> well, I, I really... Well, look, if there's anything we cannot tolerate, Mr. Hackley, it is imprecision of language. <laughs> you 
said one of the finest novels. So what were the others? Well, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, Hemingway was uh, rather impressive. <laughs> Hemingway? Good God! Uh, of course, you know that when we say uh, the word God, we don't mean to imply agreement with the concept. <laughs> We're merely using the term as a strong, idiomatic metaphor. Oh, jeez. Can't you see Hemingway's dead premises in every line that man writes? Well, uh, man's struggle against the bull, uh, the, the moment of... Uh... Hey, here, look, Hemingway was anti-life, anti-mind, and anti-reality. <laughs> Jonathan, wait. Let us wait before passing judgment. Okay, of he, course, of course. Yes, you're right. He is a lover of the brow of Swissant. That is a big plus. Keys, would you like a cigarette? This is a particularly rational brand. <laughs> rational? Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I, I, I don't smoke. What? Uh, you don't smoke? Why not? Well, uh, because I don't like to. You don't like to? You permit your mere subjective whims, your feelings, to stand in the way of reason and reality? <laughs> but surely, Miss Sand, what other possible grounds can you have for smoking than simply liking it? Uh, Mr. Hackley, Carson Sand, never. Never. Does anything out of her mere subjective feelings, only out of reason, which means the objective nature of reality? You have grossly insulted this great woman, Carson Sand, and you have abused her courtesy and her hospitality. But, but, but what possible reason can there be? Oh, kid, why are you evading the self-evident? is a symbol of the fire in man's mind, the fire of ideas. He who is against smoking is an enemy of ideas and of the mind. <laughs> a symbol, but then a match is even more of a symbol. <gasps> Enough! <laughs> How dare you mark, mock Carson Sand? You would mock God. <laughs> Jonathan, wait. Perhaps we can address his issues on a deeper level. Keys? Well, of course, yes. Keys? And this is very important. Are you a rationalist? <laughs> well, I, uh, I, uh, that's a very difficult question. Come, come, do you hold reason as your absolute? Well, yes, but I, uh, well, uh, that depends on how you define rationalism. I, I, I would think that this is a... A rationalist is a man who lives exclusively by his reason, which means by the power of his mind to grasp a reality, which means by the power of his mind to think, which means by his own power to think, Wait. which means... Wait, yeah, Jonathan? Yes, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Keith, are you a rationalist? <laughs> I approve of reason and and thinking, of course, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is that you're, you're getting at. <laughs> we are being very patient with you, Mr. Ackley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we extend every leeway and every courtesy to the lover of a brow of Zeus. Let me put it this way. Are you a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> a mistake? <laughs> No, I, I, I don't believe in this uh, Zen Buddhist oh. business of... Kate, I'm trying to have a serious conversation with you. Well, yes, but... Please, allow me the courtesy of completing even a single thought. Well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to... Surely I'm not talking about some twisted, leprous, Asiatic bum sitting somewhere in a diaper. <laughs> That's only the most obvious, the most blatant kind of mystery. Well, I know, Los Angeles is full of all sorts of queer folk. <laughs> Actually, why do you persist in again and again in a conscious and deliberate evasion of Miss Sands' uh, frank and open questions? We both know you're running like hell. Look here, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Keith, to put it simply, a mystic is someone who allows something to come between
between his reason and his reality that allows his own reason to be subjected to something else not as important. Don't you see? Are you religious, Keith? <laughs> oh, uh, am I religious? I, I see. Uh, well, not terribly. I, I go to church twice a year, uh, Christmas and Easter, you know, but, but religion plays a, a very small part in my life. Only twice a year, he says. You know where that comes from. Well, I know exactly where that comes from. Page 235, paragraph 2 of Zeus. That explains this <laughs> syndrome perfectly. Yes, and notice how he tries to curry favor with us and the mystics. That's obvious. Look, here, I didn't know that you people felt so bitterly about religion. Keith, our feelings do not count here. Our reason tells us that religion is evil. Religion is evil, which means anti-mind, which means anti-life, which means anti-reason, which means anti-reality. Well done, comrade. <laughs> Got it all figured out. Well, uh, look, I, I told you that I don't take religion very seriously. Oh, jeez, we're talking about life and death matters here, and he doesn't even... Oh. Mr. Hackley, do you take anything seriously? <sighs> wait, Keith, wait. Perhaps we can address your issue through aesthetics. What composers do you like, for example? Well, well, the usual, you know, uh, I'm not much of a musician, but... Uh, it's all right, it doesn't matter. Your tastes reveal your musical premises. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I like Beethoven, Bach, uh, Mozart, uh, Oh, stand kid, how can you? Even I have to ask myself, Beethoven, Mozart, who's... Every bar reeks of naturalism whose every note displays the malevolent universe premise. <laughs> malevolent universe premise? <laughs> Can't you see the hatred of life in every bar of their music? Look, <laughs> Mr. Hackley, you told Carson in the letter that you liked the brow of Zeus because it opposes collectivism and totalitarianism. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. Well, so how in the name of reason can't you see that a composer like Mozart, you know, which embodies the malevolent universe premise, is on the same premise as the collectivist that you claim to despise? They're all part of the same anti-mind, anti-life, <laughs> anime. Uh, are you saying that, Mo that Mozart was a collectivist? No, kid, not in that primitive sort of way, but the system of premises interconnect on a deeper and therefore a more important level. Keith, we ask every person who comes here who their favorite character is in the brow of Zeus. Who's yours? Oh, uh, I liked Joey Fontana. Joey Fontana! <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why do you prefer him, Keith? Uh, uh, well, he was on the side of good, of uh, for freedom, and he was a nice, bright, good-natured, amiable fellow. Oh. Joey Fontana, the very image of the nice, third-rate, common man. And you picked him over a hero like Kyle Crane or Sebastian Del Rey. Oh. Yeah, they were all right. They just seemed a bit wooden and one-dimensional to me. They... Uh. Enough, Keith Hackley. You have had the rare privilege of spending an evening with the greatest mind you could ever care to meet. Carson Sand, Greta Lansdon, and myself. <laughs> and above all, you, above all, you've met uh, Carson Sand, who's the greatest mind who ever has lived, ever shall live. And how have you treated this privilege? How have you treated Carson Sand? I've sat here while you've committed a series of irrational and unforgivable sins against Carson Sand. You interrupt her continually, even hardly even given her a chance to speak. You openly evaded every question which Carson or I 
put to you. You have tried to count out to us and to the mystics, you, to us and to, to, to Mozart, and to us and all the depravities of our society. You've criticized instead of asking questions. You've mocked like a hooligan. <laughs> and instead of showing proper reverence, and to whom? This woman, this woman who has given to the world the knowledge that A is A, and that two <laughs> plus two equals four. And finally, after your astonishing rudeness, you drove this woman with the pacers of Job from the room, and you capped your crimes by saying your favorite character is Joey Fontaine, the very embodiment of the nice guy, the mediocre, and the second-hander. Therefore, Keith Hackley, you have damned yourself forever more. You have made your choice, Keith Hackley, Hackley, and therefore you leave me with but only one alternative, to demand that you leave this room forever more, never to return. That's it. <laughs> Mr. Kelly, will you forgive me asking, but uh, you, you seem like a nice fella. How can you stand all this? Oh, this sort of thing goes on just about every night. You get used to it. Yeah, but, but how do you tolerate it? Oh, after a few years, you start to overlook it. You say yes a lot, sleep on the couch. It's a living. 